This is The Golden Goblet by Eloise Jarvis McGraw. We're reading chapter three and four today. And we're going to start off with defining some terms so that we can understand our reading a little better. We will define droll, mollify, solder, natron, obeisance, and bulwark. So first, droll. Curious or unusual in a way that provokes dry amusement. Mollify appease the anger or anxiety of someone. Solder, a low melting alloy, especially when based on lead and tin or brass or silver used for adjoining less fusible metals. Natron, a mineral salt found in dried lake beds consisting of hydrated sodium carbonate. Obeisance, deferential respect and bulwark, which is a defensive wall, or um, if speaking about a ship, it is an extension of the ship's sides above the level of the deck. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, we can begin reading. Renifer woke with the feeling that something important and fine had happened. He sat up, peering around him sleepily. Then he remembered his decision of the night before. Wide awake at once, he scrambled to his feet, and his eyes went automatically to the upper room. Was Gabu still sleeping, or had he gone to his work? No matter, I am not afraid of him, thought Renifer. It seemed unnecessary, however, to court trouble by investigating the matter. He stole across the courtyard, which was dingier than ever in the cool morning light. There was nothing at all on the storeroom shelves except empty crocks and baskets and a dish containing the crumbs of last night's loaf. Gebu had not yet breakfasted and Renifer decided not to wait, wait for him. Hunger was a better companion. Drinking deep from the water jar, he yanked his sash tight around his hollow middle and let himself out the gate. Running on fleet, silent feet down the street of the crooked dog, he felt frightened but jubilant. Today he would begin a new life. No longer would he be a cringing puppy, ashamed of the welts on his back, avoiding Rex's eye. He would weigh the gold, every grain, and pour the ingots and wash the sweep, and he would not carry home the wineskin when the day was done. Gebu does not want it he would say to the Babylonian. He bids me tell you he does not like your wine. Great Lord Ra burst over the eastern horizon just as Ranafir turned into the broad road that edged the fields of the flower growers. Beyond the emerald fields, he could glimpse the surface of the river, jeweled with sunlight. A flock of pintail ducks planed down over the papyrus marsh, marsh and vanished among the reeds. Saw murmured Renafir automatically, reminded of his lessons with the scribe. He halted and dropped to one knee, scratching the hieroglyph of the pintail duck in the dust with his finger. By adding a vertical stroke beside it and the picture of a man kneeling, one could write the word saw, sun. Renafir admired his handiwork a moment, then changed the kneeling man to a sitting woman, obliterated the stroke, and replaced it with a bread loaf. Behold, Sat, daughter. Renifer smiled. It gave one a sense of power to be able to write words. He wished though, that he had not added the bread loaf, tea. It reminded him of his empty stomach. He got up and hurried on. There were many people in the street now, calling greetings to one another as they set out for their work. Everywhere once he had thought of it, Renifer saw hieroglyphs. There on a doorstep was a wickerwork basket. K, yonder, N, the ripples of, on the water. The vulture wheeling above the slow moving boats was the guttural sound, ah, even the boats themselves and the rising sun, the amulet on his wrist and the beetle crawling on the dust were the same as the careful signs he had learned to draw on his clay tablet. He had not forgotten them. Perhaps if he urged his memory further, practiced each night as he lay on his mat, nothing seemed impossible today. 
buoyant with hope, he turned into the street of the goldsmiths. Ahead of him, just emerging from the apprentice's quarters and finishing his breakfast as he ran, was the new boy, Haket. The two exchanged tentative glances, then Haket's snub-nosed nosed face broke into a smile. May Ra shine upon you, comrade. And upon you, Renaferi returned eagerly. It was clear his rudeness was forgiven. Did you pour your ingot without splashing yesterday? He asked as they started on together. I, in a manner of speaking, the other said with a grin, which is to say, I watched the second craftsman pour it. He will let you do it yourself today, Renafir said. In spite of himself, his eyes strayed to the food Haket was eating as he walked. What have you there? He added, trying to sound unconcerned. Only a fig, Haket replied. He glanced at Renafir, then looked again more closely. I have another. Will you eat it? I? Oh, no, no. I merely asked. I do not care for figs. They... Renafir's hasty protests were cut short by a dismal growling from his empty belly, which felt even vaster than the Temple of Ammon this morning. Heket, still watching him, dug a second fig from his sash and held it out. Come, take it, Renafir. We'll quiet your rumblings, as the man said when he tossed his right leg to the crocodile. Renafir found himself grinning broadly as he imagined the crocodile's surprise. This Heket must be the drollest fellow in Egypt. You look quite different when you smile, said Heket, studying him curiously. Why do you not do it more often? I... I do not know. There, now you've made, now I have made you solemn again. I should put a curb on my tongue. Here, take the fig. That should cheer you. Ranafir took the fig. The temptation was stronger than his pride. Thinking Heket awkwardly, he set his teeth into the crisp golden skin. Pure honey dripped into his mouth with every bite. He thought he had never tasted anything so good. The sun was pouring into the bread courtyard, broad courtyard of the goldsmith's shop, flooding on the ovens, benches, crucibles. With the radiance that made every, even the washing vats, seem things of beauty. Parting from Heket inside the gate, Ranafir hurried into the shop to begin his first task, that of helping the weigher and the scribe issue each man's portion of gold. Rec and the craftsman had not yet arrived, but the storeroom door was open, and the older apprentices were lining up in front of the scales. The weigher emerged from the storeroom with a basket of ingots, just as Ranafir took his place beside the waiting scribe. Rejoice, friends, puffed the weigher, bobbing his head to the room in general. We will begin. Name the master's wishes, Hotepek. Four measures of the apprentice to the apprentice Hapia'o for beating into a sheet, droned the scribe reading from his tablet, and at the same time keeping a sharp eye on the scales as his companion weighed out ingots to equal four measures. Done, the weigher grunted as the scales balanced. Four measures to Hapia O, echoed Ranafir as he dug the ingots out of the leather weighing bag and handed them to the apprentice. The scribe made a mark on his tablet and read the next instruction. One half measure to Gert together with one twentieth measure of copper and of silver for preparing sold solder. The morning ritual went on, each worker accepting his portion from Ranafir and carrying it to the courtyard to begin his task, while the scribe kept strict account of every grain. Wreck the goldsmith arrived at the last measure was as the last measure was doled out. He greeted the men in his deep, gentle voice, smiled at Ranafir and bade him make ready the big furnace. As the boy started for the charcoal bin, Rek limped past him and spoke to the scribe. Well, Hotepek? Master, the figures remain the same, though I checked them thrice over. The weights do not tally. Again, we are lacking. It is not a large amount, but still it is gone. Rek was silent, and the boy dared not turn from the bin of charcoal to look at his face. He did not need to. Too well he could imagine the kindly eyes clouding, the smile fading into discouragement. Rex sighed. I do not understand it, he murmured. Eh, well, we shall have to take other steps, though I do not know what. Weigh all sweepings again today. I master. Ranifer bent over the bin, outwardly intent on scooping charcoal into the furnace pan, inwardly cursing the Babylonian and Gebu alike. Rex limping footsteps stopped behind him. Anubis save us, that is enough charcoal boy. 
the goldsmith said in a tone of mild surprise. It is only a small box I wish to solder, not Pharaoh's throne. I crave pardon, Neb Goldsmith, the boy mumbled, hastily returning a scoop or two of the black lumps into the bin. It is of no moment. Wreck hesitated, then added, Your shoulder is better today. I'm glad, Shuri. There was affection in his voice, and his use of the term small one brought sudden tears to Ranifer's eyes. So vividly did he recall his father's voice using that very endearment. He scowled fiercely to cover his emotion, and not knowing what to say to Wreck, made no answer at all. In a fluster of self-consciousness, he turned his back, dropped a hot coal into the nest of charcoal in the furnace, and began to blow on it vigorously. Gently, gently, exclaimed Wreck. Blow only a little at first, or the flame will not come. Sometime before midday, you had best make more charcoal. The bin is nearly empty. He limped onto his bench to resume work on the jewel box. He was making for the tomb of a wealthy Theban. Renifer, flushing hot as he coaxed the flame, could only fume at his own bungling. Again, he had behaved rudely to one whose friendship he most desired. Could he not at least have thanked Wreck for his concern about the shoulder? Could he not have smiled? And why, oh why, had he puffed away at that coal like an ignorant novice? when he had known for years exactly how to coax a flame into being. Wreck would think, I'm a, think him a dullard, unfit to learn the goldsmith's trade. Well, he would prove otherwise somehow. Renifer's brow cleared and his heart lightened again. He could not stay gloomy today, knowing the trouble would soon be gone from Wreck's gentle eyes. There would be no gold missing this week, nor the next, nor the next, forever. Giving a last puff to the fire, which was now blazing merrily, he hurried to answer the first craftsman's call. It was the middle of the morning before he had a moment to spare for the depleted charcoal bin. Glancing into it guiltily, he snatched up a basket and plunged out into the sunny courtyard before anyone else could cry, Ranafir, come hither. He was filling his basket at the wood box when Heket came up beside him. I was looking for you, friend, the ever scowling first craftsman, bids me ask you if you will be making charcoal today. Aye, this very minute. Good then, I'm to watch you and learn how it's done. Will you teach me? Gladly. Feeling a pleased importance, Renifer led the way across the sun-warmed pavement to an idle furnace. If you do it yourself, you will remember better. See that copper box? Fill it with these little logs from the basket. I Neb Renifer, with a grin and a mock obeisance, Heket began to arrange logs in the firing box, and Renifer used his moment of leisure to watch the work going on around him. Eagerly, his eyes moved from bench to bench, sliding over Hapia O, who was still beating ingots into sheets, lingering on the older apprentice next to him, who was winding gold wire about a rod preparatory to clipping it into links for a necklace. Renifer waited until he thrust it into the fire for annealing and made careful note of the exact dull red it reached before it was pulled out again. Across the way, young Maria, Marira knelt before one of the shaping stakes, hammering his first bowl. Marira's brow was furrowed, and Ranafir's ear told him why. The metal was not ringing true. The sound set Ranafir's teeth on edge. Marira would have a sorry and crooked bowl, he reflected, if he did not hold his elbow higher and he must stiffen his wrist, or that sharp-edged hammer would leave marks all over the gold. The craftsman should have given him one of those round-faced horn hammers, weighted with lead for his first attempt. Thutra would have done so. Is it enough, Master Renifer? came Heket's voice. It may be I could crowd in one or two more logs, but nay, that's enough, said Renifer hastily returning to the business at hand. Now the lid must go on, but do not fasten it too tightly or there will be no place for the gases to escape. We will do it thus, do you see? Leaving a little space there. He helped Hiket wire the box shut, then turned to stir up the fire. Now take the other handle, friend. We'll set the box in the furnace. So there is nothing else to do to it. But when the gases have all escaped, then the wood will be charcoal and one may take it off the fire to cool. Is it not simple? Simple if you know the trick of it, remarked the vulture as she laid a falcon egg. 
The cat chuckled at his own joke, then waved Ranafir away. Go on to your next task, friend. I'll see this done. Many thanks for the lesson. Today he does not ask me questions about myself, thought Ranafir as he moved away. Perhaps he understands that I do not wish to answer them. We shall be friends after all. Ping, pong, ping. Once more, the sour sounds of the hammer offended Ranafir's practiced ear. He paused behind Murera's bench, squirming inwardly as he watched the work being done all wrong. Finally, with some misgivings, he touched the apprentice's elbow. Eh, what is it? Can't you see I'm busy? Murera scowled over his shoulder. He was a youth of about 17 with the blunt hands of a farmer. Gold working did not come easy to him, and it was obvious his poor results with the bull had ruined his usual even disposition. I crave pardon, friend, Renevere said. I know why your bull is not shaping properly. Will you allow me to tell you? Mollified by the courteous tone, Marira shrugged his big shoulders. Well, what then if you think you know? It's certain I don't. You're not striking the metal true. Hold your elbow higher and bring the hammer down smartly. Then it will shape as you wish. Marira frowned suspiciously from Ranafir to the hammer. Perhaps it will. Perhaps not. If I strike it sharply, will it not mar the surface even more? See the hammer marks there already. You should have a different hammer, one with a round face, but this one will not mark if you keep your wrist very stiff and firm to control your aim. Would, would you let me show you? I won't then. You might ruin it. I, I might, Ranafir agreed humbly. I have little skill and less experience, but I have watched my father raise a hundred such bulls, and I know what should be done. Perhaps you do, perhaps you don't, the other grumbled, but he looked thoughtful. Once more, he placed his half-formed bull upon the shaping stake, and, raising his elbow high, gave a sharp, firm tap. The stake rang like music. Marira's face brightened. He turned the bull upon the stake and struck again, then again, then again. Each time the ring was true and already the curve of the metal was beginning to assume the proper angle. By Ammon, you're right, he exclaimed. Aye, quite right, put in an amused, put in an amused quiet voice. Both turned to find the goldsmith leaning on the next bench. He straightened, limped over to Miria, and taking the hammer from his hand, dropped it into his slot in the tool rack. Try the cow's horn mallet, my son, he advised. It will not play tricks on you. As for you, Ranafir, he turned interested eyes on the younger boy. Come with me. I have a task for you. Flushing with pleasure and confusion, Ranafir followed him to one of the smaller furnaces. Upon the low table beside it lay a stone hammering block and a coil of gold wire. Rec motioned for him to kneel on the mat and extracting a mallet from the tool rack attached to the table handed it to him. Now, small one, you know something, it seems, of gold workers' art. Do you know the manner of making the little leaves we use to ornament ladies' jewelry? I, master. Good. Make one now while I watch. Renevere dared not believe his ears. I? Make one? Neb Rec? Out of real gold? Rec only nodded toward the coil of wire and waited. Trembling with excitement, Renefir could scarcely make his fingers loosen a strand of the wire and straighten it. He, Renefir, was to be allowed to work in gold, to learn a bit, to practice, to fashion a leaf. Ay, might the gods smile on Rec the goldsmith. Might they make him rich and honored. Might Pharaoh himself shower gold upon him. Renefir's mind, fluttering as uselessly as his fingers, focused suddenly upon the fire. Was it hot enough? He stirred it, then glanced anxiously at Rec. May I use the blowpipe, master? Use whatever you need. Once clasping the familiar shape of the blowpipe, Renefir's hands steadied and so did his nerves. He could do this. He had done it many times, with Thutra watching him from his cot. There was nothing new. Just snip a length of wire, grasp it firmly in the little tongs, and careful now, with infinite caution, Renefir held the tip of the wire to the fl in the flame. Blowing a light, steady stream of air through the pipe, the flame blew to intense heat. Presently, 
the wire tip melted and ran up into a bead. At once, Renifer removed it from the, to the stone block, dropped the blowpipe and seized the mallet instead. One sharp tap and the bead flattened to a tiny leaf shape with the remainder of the wire its stem. He studied it anxiously, running his tongue over his lips. Was it good enough? Was perhaps the stem too long, the edge too thick? He raised his eyes slowly to the goldsmith's face. Rec was smiling. He had, was nodding approval at the leaf. It is a good leaf, Renifer. But then it was the first, and I was here behind you, watching every move. One is always diligent with the first. I wonder, would you use such care in making a 15th or a 50th? To be sure, Master, Renifer said in surprise, how could I do otherwise? Without care, the leaf is ruined. It must be done over. Aye, so it must. Rec picked up the leaf and examined it once more, then put it aside on the bench. Very well. This day, the Lady Ernemaat has ordered a necklace of many strands, ornamented with green stones and golden leaves. Fashion me those leaves, fifty of them, each one the twin of the last. When you have made them, bring them to me in the shop. He turned and limped away, leaving Renifer staring after him in a ferment of joy. Fifty leaves? He? He was to make the ornaments for a grand lady's necklace? Perhaps she would wear it to a dinner party at the villa of some great lord. Or count, perhaps to the palace itself. I to the palace, and Queen Tai, beloved of the two lands, would notice it and ask whence it came. And who, who had fashioned those delicate leaves, each one a work of art, and Pharaoh himself would lean from his throne to see the necklace better and to work, stupid one, Ranafir chided himself, dreaming will fashion no works of art. Cease gawking at the gold and use it. The day passed in a blissful haze, which not even the gnawing of Ranafir's empty stomach could penetrate. Even after the leaves were finished, the 50th, the twin of the first, and all made with supreme and loving care. His spirits continued to soar. Perhaps Wreck would now let him make leaves every day, perhaps allow him to anneal wire, spread solder just so on the boxes, and learn and become skillful. Even back at his old chores of washing the sweep and pouring molds, Ranafir's wrapped face and hurrying small body radiated such joyful hope that a contagion of, of laughter and joking swept over the whole courtyard. Even the first craftsman ceased to scowl, though he could not have told why. At last, the day was done. A good day, a fine, fortunate day, favored by all the gods. It lacked but one thing to place the seal of total success upon it, and that would take place very soon. Ranifer timed his leaving to coincide with Hakets. With his friend beside him, he stepped confidently out the courtyard gate into the long shadows, striping the street of the goldsmiths. At once, he spotted the Babylonian waiting for him in a doorway ahead. He walked on, a little nervous now, but trying not to show it. Surely with Haket beside him, Ibni would not even dare approach him. Ibni was not so easily put off. As the two boys drew near him, even with his doorway, he stepped out, grinning and bobbing his head, holding out the wineskin. A little gift for your honored brother, young Ranafir. I pray you carry it home to him. True, it is a poor gift and unworthy of him, but the wine is made by my wife from our own dates, and though humble, Ranafir drew a long breath and faced him. Kebu does not want it, he said. He bids me tell you he does not like your wine. Without waiting to see the effects of his words, he hurried on. Hakep followed, glancing back over his shoulder. A queer fellow, that porter, he remarked. I think you offended him, friend Ranafir. He has an ugly glint in his eye. Let him. I'll not fetch and carry for such a one. I think he's half a crocodile. With his grin and his stinking breath, Ranafir swelled with satisfaction. He had bested his enemy with exactly the scornful phrases he had imagined this morning, and the seal of success was on the day. He dismissed Ibni from his mind, sniffing the air luxuriously. The shop's hot odor of molten gold 
had given way to the fragrance of lotus and marshweed, mingled with the familiar reek of the Nile and the pungent smell of natron and spices from the, the street of the embalmers, which they were passing at the moment. To Ranafir, lightheaded with hunger and triumph, all the world seemed tinged with remarkable beauty. The western cliffs burned amber in the last of the sunshine. To the north, a falcon wheeled slowly over the shining walls of Pharaoh's palace, as if to proclaim the pe presence within of the royal god king he symbolized. Yonder from the fields, like flute notes, sounded the creaking of the water wheels. The gods smile on Egypt, murmured Ranafir. And on you too today, is it not so? I saw you making leaves there like some elder craftsman, and by the hidden one, the master himself could have done no better. Renifer drank in the praise and the respectful glance which accompanied it. My father taught me how to make them. In a burst of confiding, he added, perhaps Rec will teach me more now. Perhaps someday I shall be a master goldsmith and make necklaces for the queen. May Amon grant it, Haket replied warmly. Then perhaps he will smile more often. They walked on in sudden silence, each a little abashed by his own sincerity. As the familiar palm thatched outlines of the apprentice's quarters loomed ahead, Hecat resumed his usual flippant tone. Behold, the great palace of the downtrodden approaches. It is not a monument fit for the gods themselves. Ay, what a life we lead there. Dancing, parties, mad frivolity. Well, friend, I fear I must leave you now, as the hare remarked to the hunter. Farewell, and may Newit guard your sleep. Renifer grinned and waved, reflecting that anyone would smile more often when Hecat was around. He went on alone, trying to ignore the aroma of frying fish that drifted from the apprentice's quarters, and it seemed from every other house he passed. In spite of himself, there rose in his mind the image of a golden brown bolty fish, crisp without and succulent within, served on a platter and giving off fragrances sweeter than the lotus. Do not think of it, he ordered himself. To forget it, he began to run, almost colliding with a group of glassmakers as he turned into the main thoroughfare that paralleled the Nile. He dodged in and out among the homebound workers, shouting greetings to Kai, the baker's boy, and a few other urchins he knew. He was turning his whole attention to physical activity so that he might not notice the nagging uneasiness beginning to force its way into the conscious part of his mind. It grew stronger the nearer he drew to the street of the crooked dog. But the stronger it grew, the faster he ran, refusing to let it in, shoring up the bulwarks of his mind against it. Only when he drew up, breathless at his own doorway, flung it open and stepped inside, did his defenses crumble like faulty dikes. Faced with the dingy, familiar courtyard, all the eager hopes of the day vanished beneath a torrent of blackest fear. He had come home empty-handed. He had defied Gebu. In vain, he tried to summon the proud resolve, the brave words he had planned last night. Behold, behind him, the gate swung shut with a click like the jaws of a crocodile closing. And yonder, across the court, Gebu rose slowly from the bottom stair. Half an hour later, Ranafir sat hunched on the rough pavement of the courtyard, trying to stop the bleeding of his nose. Gebu still stood over him. His face was rock hard, save for the convulsively winking eye. His fists were like stones. He spoke in a voice that was hoarse with fury. Has understanding now entered your head, slow-witted one? Ranafir managed to nod. He could not speak. His body was raw with pain. His mind was like a disordered room with ringing, still ringing with panic. I am ready to instruct you further if need be. You will bring the wineskin tomorrow to atone for your empty hands tonight. You'll bring it the next time also and the next and the next. Do you hear? Do you understand? Again, Renafir nodded and the fresh welts on his back throbbed like a fist opening and closing. Gebu continued to glare at him a moment. Then... He thoughtfully fished a particle of food from between his teeth. By Amon, I'll wager you'd hop fast if you were under my eye all day. You've gone late, grown lazy and insolent, playing about with gold, doing as you pleased. How would you like it, spawn of crocodiles, 
if you were never to walk through Rex's doorway again. Renifer raised startled eyes and Gebu's lips twisted. Aye, you had best dance to my tune. You are a goldsmith's helper. Is it not what you want? Fail me once more, only once, and you'll find yourself a stonecutter's apprentice instead. I must have some use of you. He moved on up the stair, leaving Ranafir aghast. Stonecutter's apprentice? Apprentice to Gebu? Within reach of his fists all day, pounding chisel against stone with great heavy mallets instead of fashioning leaves or watching the gold turn crimson in the crucible? Seven years of bondage, all the while learning a craft he hated with never a chance for the one he loved? Dismay changed quickly to despair. It's no use, he thought, no use, no use. Dazed with pain and hunger, he crept to his mat and buried his head in his arms. Chapter four. Ranafir awoke with the plan fully formed in his mind. He sat up, blinking and confused. Was he still dreaming? Surely when he closed his eyes last night, he had felt no hope, seen no way out. Yet this morning, a solution was here before him. Carefully afraid to believe in it, yet he examined his plan. Except for one small risk, he found it flawless. Obviously, the gods had brought it to him while he slept. Doubtless, it was one god only, he thought more humbly, as he rolled up his mat and started for the storeroom. A minor god, one of no importance, one perhaps helped me for my father's sake. Or perhaps it was no god at all, but my father himself. He stood still beside the water jar, feeling the tears come into his eyes and stinging lids, stinging, sting the lids. If that were true, if he could think his father's ba sometimes fluttered out of the tomb by night on its little bird wings and came to see if all was well with him. His eyes narrowed suddenly in an effort to call back a memory of the night or perhaps a dream. No, it was not a dream. Something had happened deep in the middle of the night. A step, a sound, that was it, a sound. It had half wakened him and he had been afraid for a moment because he had thought he, it was the squeak of the leather hinges on Gebu's bed, bedroom door. He knew now it was not, it had not been the hinges. It was a soft fluttering of his father's ba. Finding the earthen mug in his hand, he dipped it into the water jar and drank. As he, had, as he did so, an idea came to him. He turned quickly to the shelf. On it was a plate containing two bread loaves, half an onion, and the scanty remnants of a salted fish, the leavings from Gebu's breakfast. It seemed a banquet, and never had Renifer been so glad to see plenty instead of not enough. Scrupulously, he divided the food in half, taking pains even with the crumbs. One half he ate, the other he nodded into his ragged sash as he hurried out of the courtyard. In the street, he cast an anxious glance at the sun. If he hurried, there would be just time enough to thank his father properly. A few minutes later, he was scrambling breathlessly along a path northwest of the city of the dead, where the cliffs curved far inward toward the river. In the sandy wasteland around him were the graves of the city's poor, each with an earthen jug or plate beside it, holding the sun-dried remnants of a funerary offering. Behind this common burial ground, the rough face of the cliff was honeycombed, with the better tombs of artisans and scribes and merchants carved into the rock itself. One of these was Thutra the goldsmiths. Arriving at the place, Renifer stopped a moment to catch his breath. Then respectfully, he entered the tiny chapel of his father's tomb. It was no more than a shallow alcove hewn into the face of the cliff with an offering table against one wall and a small stone statue of Thutra opposite. Facing the entrance was a false door, built against the bricked inside of the shaft that dropped straight downward to the burial chamber itself. Renifer looked with large eyes at this door. It could not open. It was not made so. Yet through it, his father's ba had magically emerged last night and fluttered on silent wings to the street of the crooked dog to help his son. Renifer turned to the little statue. It was not a good likeness. 
Gebu had hired an indifferent sculptor whose price was cheap, and the result looked nothing like the Thatcher Renifer remembered. But it was all he had. Father, he said softly. His vo voice seemed to set up a curious rustling in that silent place. He darted a wary glance at the false door, not knowing whether to feel hopeful or afraid. However, no wraith-like human-headed bird appeared. Untying his sash, he arranged his, the bits of food upon the plate on the offering table. It looked a poor enough meal to set before one's father. Perhaps he should not have eaten the other half. Father will understand how hungry I was, he thought. Turning to the statue again, he whispered rapidly, Father, thank you. I'm sorry I could not bring a better gift. Please, please come again. With a little bow and a, uh, and a last odd look at the false door, he backed out of the chapel and set off hurriedly for Rex's shop and his work. By the time he arrived at the street of the goldsmiths, he had thought over the plan once more. It was a good plan except for the, that one risk. He must confide in Heket. Dared he trust so much to another's ears and tongue? Especially to a boy he had known only two short days? The more he thought of it, the larger the risk seemed. No matter, I must take it, he thought. There is no other way, if I can find him alone somehow. Heket was nowhere in sight as Ranafir hurried toward the familiar gate. Indeed, the street was almost deserted. Guiltily, Ranafir broke into a run, but he entered the courtyard to find the morning weighing already over and everyone scattering to the first tasks. Red-faced and breathless, Ranafir presented himself to Rek. I crave pardon, Neb Goldsmith, for coming late. I could not help it. I carried an offering to my father's tomb. May his three thousand years be full of joy, Rek said gravely. You are excused, son who honors his father. Go now to the first craftsman and find out your task. Sata was at the far end of the courtyard, with Heket beside him. The craftsman turned as Ranafir came to toward them, and his roar could be heard all over the shop. There he is at last. Where have you been for half the morning, tardy one idler? No excuses. Here, show this ignorant one how to make hard solder. I want four days' supply ready by the time Ra's chariot is there. Pointing Eris irascibly straight up, Sata stalked away. Heket put a finger in his ear and wiggled it rapidly. I thought I heard a voice, the cow remarked as she stood on the leopard's tail. Sata is not so bad as he sounds, Ranafir said with the laugh Heket always drew out of him. Still, we've none too much time to make four days' supply of solder. Come along. What luck, he was thinking as he led the way to the scales. We can talk as we work with no one suspecting. Wish I knew for a certainty that Heket can guard a secret. I must try to find out more about him. I'll ask him questions, personal ones, such as he is always asking. He has discovered enough about me in the past two days. While they waited for their supply of metals to be weighed out, Ranafir tried in vain to devise such questions. He could not think of one. It did not help him that he had constantly to answer the dozens that flowed from Heket as usual without the slightest effort. Oh, do we mix copper in the solder? Of course. You cannot solder gold with gold. Why not? Because your work would melt at the same moment as you solder, donkey head. The solder must melt first. Oh, then what's the silver for? We use it to... We use it too. In the solder? Aye, I'll explain everything presently. Go fetch the molds. Of course, which ones? Well, one is flat and like you were using for the ingots? Nay, never mind, I'll fetch them myself, Ranavir said distractedly. Here, take the metals that to that far oven yonder and wait for me. A few moments later, he spread everything upon a workbench beside the designated oven, which he had chosen because no one chanced to be working near it today. Before Heket could start talking again, he said in a low voice, I have something to ask of you. It's important. Heket looked at him, then glanced around the courtyard. Ask away, friend. There's no one listening. Ranafir's lips parted, then closed again as his courage failed him. Aye, but I... First, we had best begin the work. Avoiding Heket's curious eye, he reached for a pair of snippers, motioning the other to do the same. 
We cut these scraps and lengths of wire into small pieces about this size, you see? Copper in this bowl, silver in this, and gold here. As they began to snip, he searched his mind frantically for those clever probing questions. Where do you live? He blurted finally. Then flushed because all of all questions he might have selected this was the least clever. Also the least useful, he told himself exasperatedly. Why, you know, Hiket said with a mild surprise, at the apprentice's quarters. Nay, I mean at home, where your parents live. Ah, they live upriver, at Hermonthus. Did you wonder why I do not sleep at home? Nay, I merely... It does not matter to me where you live, of course. It matters exceedingly to my parents, remarked Hiket with a laugh. Our house is small, and I have six brothers and a sister, all younger than I. Things got a little crowded, as the mole explained when he crawled out of the ant hill. Ranafir flashed him an uneasy smile, but pressed on with his questions. Your father, is he an artisan, perhaps? There was a short silence. Ranafir looked around to find Hakat studying him. Sharp intelligence written over every feature of his homely, good-natured face. Nay, my father is an overseer of stores on Lord Ma Mahotep's estate. It is a position of trust, and I was brought up to know that word. Many times I have helped my father tally the mistress's cupboard with all her fine trinkets, the golden boxes, the necklaces, the goblets with silver stems. It was handling them that first made me want to make such things, I think. Many times, too, father bade me take delicacies to the master's table to see if I would tuck a honey cake into my own sash or eat just one grape. Often he whispered me a trumped-up secret to test if I could blab it to another. Hakat paused again, smiling. You need not worry, Ranafir. I know how to keep my lips sealed. Ranafir's face felt as if fires were burning beneath the skin. I ask your pardon, he mumbled. No need of it, friend. I'm not offended. In a somewhat awkward silence... Both boys turned back to their snipping. Presently, Hakat remarked cheerfully, Solder making is the easiest of tasks, if this is all there is to it. Renifer returned with a start to the business at hand. We have only begun. I fear my mind is not on my work, as the, the donkey said when the, the, as the worm said when the lark bit its head off, Hakat supplied glibly. Both boys giggled, and the atmosphere was easy again. I do not know how you think of all these those jokes, Ranafir said as he dragged the mold forward. Nor I, Hakat said airily. Are we to snip no more? There is metal left over. We'll do that later. Poke up the fire a bit. Now, do you see the this block of charcoal with the hollow in it? And this funny-looking mold? Rapidly, Ranafir explained the hearth, hearthstone mold a stone ground flat with a bar-shaped depression in the center and little groves, grooves scraped from it to let the air out. As he talked, he wired the block of charcoal firmly to one end of the stone, then began measuring snippets of metal into the hollow in the charcoal. Gold first, then the copper. Not too much, you see. It makes the solder a rich, a good rich color, but if we use copper alone, the solder would not flow easily. Therefore, we add silver too. Now, put it into the fire. Nay, not the stone, great Amon. Turn the whole thing about. It is the block of charcoal we want to heat. It is true, I am a donkey head, Hakette said meekly. Ranafir laughed, then grew serious. Nay, you are not. You saw at once why I was asking you those questions. I did not blame you, my... Blame you, friend. Only a fool pours beer into a vessel without making sure it will not leak. Look, the charcoal's glowing. Both boys leaned over the oven. There, Ranafir said as the metal snippings collapsed into liquid. Now tilt it. Gently. Together they watched the molten puddle run from the hollowed charcoal into the stone mold to which it was wired. Half a minute later, they were knocking a thin, flat bar of solder out onto the workbench. Ranafir picked it up and showed it to Hakat. There it is. Do the next one yourself, and I will go on snipping. 
While we work, I, I will tell you this thing. Renifer glanced around the courtyard. Everyone was busy. Ibni was nowhere in sight. He took up the snippers. Hakette, the tiny measuring scoop. Their heads bent close together. Renifer drew a long breath, hesitated one more anxious moment, then plunged straight into the middle of his story. Hakette, I know who is stealing gold from the shop. Great, Taz, whiskers. Hakette's head snapped up, his jaw dropped. Shh, I know who is stealing and I know how he is doing it. But are you certain? I am certain. Then you must tell Rack. Why, it is wonderful. He, st keep your voice down. I want to tell Rack, but I cannot. I, why can you not? Because I have been helping the thief. Hakette became very still without daring to look at him. Ranafir whispered, I did not know I was helping. I swear it. I did not even know gold was missing until Rek told me two days ago. Then I started thinking. He turned to Hakat miserably. It is those wineskins. Wineskins? You saw Ibni try to give me one yesterday. I carried them home. I've been doing it for months, never knowing. Do you see? Ibni is nothing but a tool in the hands of my half-brother, and so am I. Hakette's eyes looked into his, wide and comprehending. Suddenly, the first craftsman's bellow rang across the courtyard. Well, dreamers, do you mean to stand all day and gawk at one another? Get on with your solder making. Both boys jumped to their work for a few moments until Sata turned back into the shop. Their hands flew and their tongues were still. Then Hakette, straightening from the oven, murmured, You can tell Rek. He would not believe you meant to steal from him. Perhaps not. It makes no difference. It is not Rek I fear. It is Gebu. Gebu? What would he do if he told? What would anyone do with the tool that turned on him? Look out. Your mixture is melting. As Hakette bent hastily to the mold, Renifer went on snipping and whispering with equal urgency. What would you do with a hammer that would not balance or a knife that would not cut? You would break it in anger, then get another. But if Gebu is seized for the thefts, Gebu would never be seized, only Ibni or I, the cat thought a moment. You refused to take that wineskin yesterday. I, Renifir gave an involuntary shiver. I'll not refuse the next one, you may be sure of it. Gebu is a devil, I tell you. I do not want to go on thieving for him, yet I must until Rek is told. Then Rek must be told. Aye, but I cannot do it. I cannot, Hakette. Therefore, therefore what? Therefore, I want you to tell him. I? Hakette faced him, startled. Why not? He will believe you. Oh, you must. I beg you, beg it of you. But I know nothing about it, how it is done, or I will tell you all that. There is only one way it could be done. I am sure of it. Rapidly, Ranafir explained what he suspected about Ibni and the big washing vats. Hakette nodded slowly. I had not thought of those vats, nor has Rek, I'll wager. For proof, Rek need only find where Ibni hides that wineskin, some cranny in the storeroom, very likely. He must drop the gold in bit by bit, a grain at a time, because ten days or mo more go by between the times I am called on to take home Gebu's little gift. Ranafir spat angrily, then, with a glance toward the shop, picked up his nippers again. It is clever. So hard to trace, Saket said. Yet I see quite well how it could be done. You have not yet said that you will tell Rack. I will tell him, friend. Renifer drew in his breath with painful relief. Thank you. I thought you would help me, but I... And you will not whisper to anyone that it came from me, because Gebu will, would learn of it. I'll not mention your name. Leave everything to me. Perhaps I had best not go to Rek at all until tomorrow, since you and I have been talk seen talking together today. Aye, that would be best. I'll not come near you for a few days. St, here comes Sata. The boys sealed their agreement with a glance and fell busily to work. There was no chance to say more, not even another thank you, for Sata stayed near the rest of the morning. After the midday break, the boys separated to different tasks, but Ranafir's head rang with the words all day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Then that evening, as he was leaving the shop, he saw Ibni waiting with the wineskin in his hand. 
Ranafir stopped aghast. He'd forgotten that this was bound to happen. He would have turned back into the shop, dodged down an alley, vanished into thin air if he could, but there was no avoiding the Babylonian this time. His voice was as wheedling as ever, but there was an open threat in his eyes as he stepped in front of Ranafir and blocked his way. Ah, greetings to you, little one. I feared I had missed you with my little gift. You were mistaken yesterday, were you not, when you told me the message from your honored half-brother? Did you not find out you had misunderstood him? Surely he would like a little wine made from our own grapes. Give it to me and be gone, Renafir said through set teeth. He snatched the wineskin and stalked by the Babylonian, taking pleasure in treading on his toe as he passed. Half blinded by angry tears, he almost walked straight into Haket, who was lurking in a doorway further down the street waiting for him. Renafir motioned in silence toward the wineskin. Aye, Haket said, this will spoil our plan for tomorrow, won't it? It spoils everything, everything. Here is the proof we need in my hand before we even had time to make use of it. Now we will have to wait and wait and wait until he has collected more in another wineskin. We will wait then. Four or five days will make little difference after all. How do we know? I do not want to wait. If we must, we must. Hecat touched Ranafir's shoulder awkwardly. Never fear. We'll catch him, as the tortoise said to the snail. Ranafir tried to smile, but he could not help feeling that Hecat's smile had for once been unfortunately chosen. He started homeward, the, the hated wineskin under his arm. When he arrived at the street of the crooked dog, he found Gabu in such roaring good humor that he knew the beatings at least were over for a while. Wenamon, Gebu's friend of the noiseless feet and drooping cloak, had been paying a call. The two were on their way down the stair as Ranafir entered the courtyard. Hi, it is the little messenger, bellowed Gebu as his eyes went to the wineskin. To Wenamon, he added in an undertone, though it is of small importance now, eh? And burst into a roar of laughter. Before Ranafir had time to wonder what he meant, he beckoned peremptorily. Well, well, come here, messenger, make your delivery and receive your reward. Renifer approached cautiously, handed the wineskin to him and jumped back out of range. He did not trust Gebu's rewards. This time, however, Gebu paid no attention to him. He was showing the wineskin to Wenamon with a grin. A gift from a friend, grown on his own vines and made by his wife's hand. Is that not touching? A pity we cannot drink it. Renifer did not think so. It was obvious Gabu had drunk a great deal of wine already. He started for the storeroom to see if there were anything to eat. Stay! Do you not want the reward I promised? Gabu shouted. I had that yesterday, Ranafir muttered. So you did. But you'll like this one better, I dare say. There was a metallic clink on the pavement behind Ranafir. He whirled in astonishment and saw a copper ring coin lying there. Well... Pick it up. Pick it up. Do you think it's a scorpion? Now go buy food and eat it. I can count every rib on your back. First, take this wineskin up to my... Gebu stopped abruptly, then grinned at when Amon and finished. Nay, I will take it. He staggered noisily up the stairs. While he was gone, Renifer stood clutching his copper and enduring when Amon's steady, bright-eyed gaze. It made every hair on his head prickle, and it seemed to go on forever. At last, Gebu reappeared, however, singing at the top of his voice. Without taking further notice of Ranafir, the two left the courtyard and started down the street in the direction of the docks. Ranafir wasted no time in taking advantage of Gebu's sudden generosity. The moment the sound of ruckus singing and had faded around the corner, he slipped out of the gate and ran in the opposite direction. With luck, Kai, the baker's boy, would have a few loaves left and he could eat his fill for once.